Good morning. My name is Owen Woods. Thank you for coming to listen to a talk on security, which I realise that compared to Raspberry Pis is arguably not the sexier subject, but I would argue is quite important. Um, this is a terribly intimidating room to speak in because it's all lights and no people. Um, are you all there? You are all there. Lovely. Um, I've got a confession to make. Uh, well, several, actually. One, I'm not a security engineer, but I do talk quite a lot about security. But then I think that's a good thing because, as I'll mention in a minute... One of the problems with security is that it tends to be security people talk about it. The other confession, don't tell the DevOps people, um, this is slightly longer than a 50-minute talk, so I'm going to be compressing it slightly because I've got precisely 50 minutes. And given the imposing screen telling me how long I've got left, I, I don't dare overrun. Uh, as I said, my name's Owen Woods. Uh, I know that's not entirely obvious unless you're from Ireland. Drop the E off the front. It all makes sense. Uh, I'm the CTO at a company called Indava. I've been there about 18 months, and before that, I worked for 10 years in capital markets for UBS, of which many of my old colleagues are here, which is very nice, um, and Barclays Global Investors. Uh, and I've been doing architecture and software engineering for quite a long time in both products and, uh, and uh, applications. So um, security is kind of difficult who here kind of agrees broadly with that statement? A few hands. In fact, I didn't ask. Who here works as a security specialist? Security engineer, security, secure development, CISO? About three of you. Right, okay. Um, who here works as a mainstream developer? Yep, nearly everybody. Great. And who works on a secure system? Uh, oh, fair sprinkly if you're good. Um, you might know quite a bit of this. We'll see as we go. So security is difficult, but it's becoming more important all the time. One of the big drivers for that is this um, new, um, I don't call it a fad because in Dava I talk about it a lot, but this new idea of digital transformation. What does digital transformation really mean? It, means taking, it often means taking internal systems that you never had any intention of internet connecting and connecting them directly to people in China who might want to attack them. That's the security engineer's perspective on digital transformation. Now, that's why they look at you askance when you say, we're going to connect the back office to the internet. The snag is that most people, uh, security is kind of a bit specialist, and most people don't have lots of security training. Um, those of you who work, um, those of you, other than people who work on secure systems, how many of you have had at least a week's training in secure system development? Like I'm, really, I'm really heartened that there's even three, but I mean, three out of the room is a small sample. So um, it's, it's quite a specialist field, and we need to learn about it. And actually, most of us approach it through technology. Because we have great bits of software like OAuth or Spring Security. And we've got tools like FX, COP, and FindBugs. The problem is, is that any security engineer will tell you starting with the technology isn't actually going to help you be secure. It probably will increase your level of security. But until you understand what the problem is, actually applying the technology doesn't work very well. So what security engineers talk about, my, my sort of hidden agenda here, which clearly isn't hidden anymore, is that I'm going to persuade, try and persuade you that, that following a bit, of a bit of a security process alongside just traditional software engineering is a really good idea, secure system or not. And the core of that is something called threat modeling. Who here has heard of threat modeling? Yeah, lots. Brilliant. How many of you do it routinely? Oh, not a single hand. No, one hand. Well done, sir. Um, so I'm going to try and persuade you it's not difficult and you should do a lot more of it. Um, the caveats are, I'm not a security engineer, but hey, we're all friends here. Uh, the other thing is I don't talk much about implementation. That there's, that I've got other talks on that. So why do we need security? Uh, we need security. Uh, security people tell you we need it because of malice, error, and mischance. Or the way I always think of it, people are bad, stupid, and unlucky. And that's actually why you need security. It's for all those reasons. We tend to focus on the bad people and keeping them out, but actually security is just as much about preventing stupid people doing unfortunate things, and people are just unlucky. Every big bank's got a story of how somebody's typed the wrong command during a deployment, and very bad things have happened, and you know they've been out of the market for a day and a half. Everyone's got a story like that. We're not going to name names. We're all friends here. Um, that's the sort of unlucky. That's, security's good for those situations too. Or... Um, you know, fat finger traders, all those kind of problems. And the thing is that anything of value in your systems may attract, may attract attention of the sort you don't want. People who want to steal it, people who want to commit fraud, disrupt you, and so on. So why do we care? If you go in and actually, you go into the fundamentals of why we really care about this, it's because all of these problems imply a loss of some sort. 
Now, we always think about financial loss, and that's important. If people can defraud a payment system, hands up anyone who works for the SWIFT network, um, then clearly that loss is very tangible. But there are many less tangible kinds of, risk, uh, kinds of losses, sorry, which are just as important. Um, a large bank I used to work for um, were extremely concerned about reputational risk, and they were quite right to be, because a lot of the reason clients come to them is because they have a gold standard reputation for trust, reliability, and so on. Um, to, it, it can be hard to quantify that, but should there be a major security breach, that's going to have a major reputational impact. And there's also things that are quite subtle you don't necessarily think of as related to security, like advantage. Um, does anyone know the simplest attack you can perform on an auction site? It doesn't tend to work so well today, but in the old days it worked very well. If you're bidding against somebody, what, what do you want to do to get the best price? Stop them bidding. What's a good way in a web system to stop somebody being able to access a web application, naively? Yeah, denial of service. Actually, that, that's a bit more sophisticated than I was thinking. It's a kind of single-user denial of service. On many websites, what would happen if you tried to log in using random passwords 20 times in fast succession? You'd get locked out, wouldn't you? And they'd invalidate all the session cookies. And what would happen next time that person tried to bid? Oh, they'd suddenly have to go through a password reset. So if you time that right, they're out of the auction. eBay actually had that problem many, many years ago. And I mean, clearly, they've come a long way, and they now have very sophisticated controls and heuristics to prevent it. But we've got a, security looks at all these areas. I mean, um, advantage is a subtle one, but one that actually is, is, is very easy to miss. So security is fundamentally the business of managing these risks. And the way I always describe security, because what's the problem if you say to managers, um, speaking as a manager today myself, um, I'm going to do more security work? What's their first question? How late is this project going to run because of it? Because they always think, well, this is going to take a lot of time. And then you talk about scanning tools, and their, their eyebrows move ever further up their foreheads, don't they, when you start talking about the cost. But the way that I always explain it to them is that this is an insurance policy. You can choose not to um, buy uh, insurance for your house. If you're a trader, you can choose not to hedge your positions. And I have some personal painful history with that particular case. Um, in all of these cases, it's, it's a type of insurance. And that's the way that I try and sell security to people. And just a bit of basic terminology security people use, because one of the problems with security is because it's a specialist field. Um, very few people here were security specialists. Was it one or two? Clearly, if I went to the RSA conference and I said, how many security specialists, all the hands would go up. And then I'd say, how many mainstream software developers? It'd be like one or two. It'd be the opposite. We're sort of different communities. And so terminology often gets in the way. So a few basic bits of terminology, which I've had to update recently. These things change over time. But four things security people, security specialists obsess about are, quite rightly, are assets, what's worth stealing or attacking, subjects, who should and shouldn't be allowed to um, interact with your system in different ways, policies, what are the rules of the game? Should, who should be allowed to release a payment? Who should be allowed to see personnel records? That's policy. And then threats, which is actually where it gets interesting, finally. Um, that's the reason rules might be broken. That's vulnerabilities, attackers, um, things that, that can go wrong. Those are the threats to your policy, which can result in um, uh, risks, um, risk happening to your assets, bad things happening to your assets. And the other thing that's always worth remembering is that as engineers, we do tend to look at the technology because, frankly, the technology is an awful lot easier to work with than the people because it's much more predictable. But actually, security does involve these three classic bits, people, process, technology. And you are as secure as your weakest link. I'm sure you've all heard that phrase, tripped out by your security specialists. Uh, but they're right. If you, have, um, if you have people who don't understand the security um, setup, if you have processes that aren't inherently secure then there's no point having lots of security technology. Schneier likes to say, have you all read one of Bruce Schneier's books at least? One? He's a major thinker, speaker, sort of, um, um, you know, um, opinion former, I suppose you'd call him, in security. Security is not a product, it's a process. So when you talk uh, again about just introducing security, don't need to go right through this, but um, this is a famous picture from the OWASP organization, who I'll very briefly mention at the end if you've not come across them. And this is, summarizes why we care. And this is also the terminology that threat agents, bad guys, use attack vectors, that's ways into your system, 
to exploit security weaknesses that overcome security controls that allow them to have an impact on an asset. And why do we care about any of this? Because it's got a business impact. And that's why they, that, that's why they put this slide up, really. It's the fact that we're very worried on this side, because it's all technical, it's all very exciting, but actually it's this we're worried about. If there's no business impact, you may not have a security problem. And the key requirements that security people will talk about repeatedly are confidentiality, keeping things secret, which they also call privacy, integrity, making sure that you know if things have been changed and who changed them, avoiding accidental or malicious destruction, availability, which is making sure that things are available when you want them to be and not when anonymous decide that they, uh, that they should be. Somebody mentioned distributed denial of service attacks. And finally, accountability, or which is classically actually called non-repudiation, which means you cannot deny that you performed an action in a secure system. So I sent you a message. I cannot deny that I sent you that message. So given that whistle-stop tour of the background, how would we go about securing systems? There's four aspects to it, and it's really simple, but this is, the, this is my kind of block diagram overview for the non-security specialist. You've got to understand your system. I know that sounds obvious, but how many of you understand every detail of your current systems? Don't a single one of you dare put your, put your hands up. We, we never understand everything. So you've got to understand your system and its environment. Um, that should say assets and policy. I don't know what's gone wrong there. Um, you should, we need to do some analysis so we understand the problem. We need to mitigate our risks. That's the bit that most of us start at. This is security countermeasures. That's all the technology. And then finally, we've got to actually have some assurance that we've done the right thing and that we have some heightened level of security. So looking at understand, I'm not going to delve into this very much. I mean, you need to understand your system. You're all highly intelligent engineers. You're the self-selecting DevOps audience. Um, the, only, um, the only point I'd make is that I know that um, and Simon Brand's talking this afternoon, so he'll talk a lot about this. I know that there is a general reaction against writing too much down. But actually, if you need to have a discussion about how a system works and its environment, at least having temporary throwaway documentation is very useful. Because remember, it's not just the software developers in your team are going to need to be part of that discussion. Lecture over. So you need to understand it. Once you've understood it, there's a couple of steps in analysis which we need to, we need to go through. And these are not difficult, but often when I go and talk to teams, um, especially when I go and talk to our clients about how they're going to implement one of our services is secure software development. And some clients are keen on the idea, but we need to go and explain it. And I, I do say, when you're securing systems, what is it you're securing? And I always look at me blankly and go, well, the system. No, I, I know, but what's in the system that's valuable? Well, you know, the stuff in the system. Yes, I, I know that, but some bits are more valuable than others. Yeah, I guess so. Do you know which they are? Not really. How are you hoping to secure this? We take your point. Okay, we, we, we could use some help. So the, the, the important thing is, where do we focus our attention? And this is where we use the idea of assets or resources. We have, um, that should say assets, I do apologize. Um, we need to identify the value. Some things in your system are obviously valuable. If you talk to um, uh, Ashley Madison about what's valuable in their system, they were the... Um, uh, adulterous dating site that got uh, turn, turned over a while ago. Um, it's pretty obvious to them now what's valuable in their system. It's the entire list of all the people who've ever registered. That's clearly valuable to someone. Um, on the other hand, um, it's not always exactly clear what is valuable. I'll give you one tangible example. Um, uh, I was working for a major bank, and we were, talking, we were going through thought experiments about using public cloud for development environments. And I had a very strong um, statement that because we didn't use production data... And frankly, I didn't feel that our binary code was that valuable to the wide world, that it wasn't a huge security problem. Until I was talking to one of our lead engineers who had clearly been thinking about this harder than I had. Well done to him. Um, and the point he made was, if you were going to attack our network, what would be really useful? Well, I went, well, all kinds of stuff, you know, obviously credentials and people and topologies. And he said, yes, topologies. What's in the running system that would help you? Oh, configuration files. They're really valuable to attackers because they often, configuration files, help you map out an internal network. So that's quite a subtle one. And, okay, maybe not the most valuable thing, but definitely something that I had to rethink there's nothing valuable going into the cloud. I, actually, I was, I, I was incorrect. And that was a good piece of security analysis. So what's valuable to anyone? 
And the other thing is, it's not just static stuff, the data, it's the operations. Which operations are sensitive, which operations can be largely uncontrolled? And any security engineer will point out that, firstly, this is, this is very difficult and you'll need a security engineer. They're not really right. It's not that difficult. But they're right in the sense that you need focus because it, you often, unfortunately, it's quite easy to do at a broad brushstroke level until you go into some fine detail. The classic example is HR records. Within one entity, you know, employee, some of those fields will be largely public knowledge. Some will be super sensitive. So, I mean, I know it's a trivial example. Think, think about your data models. At the broad brush stroke, you can probably classify stuff. When you get more detailed, that may, be, may get a bit more complicated. And once you know what you're trying to protect, the next thing you've got to work out is how, how should that be protected? And the, as I said, the, uh, the jargon for this is security policy. All policy means is the rules. It's the spec for the security system. That's all it is. Um, all, you've got, all you have to do, although it, it, that game takes time and effort, is who can use the system, principles or subjects, what are they going to work on, and what are they allowed to do? And, it's, and in many systems, this can be as simple as access control matrices. Though, has anyone got access control matrices for a real system here? Quite a lot of you. Oh, not that many. Okay. Uh, often I get lots of hands. Um, who's got a really big one? Like more than 20 columns, more than 20 rows. Oh, yes. There's one hand's gone up and I can even visualize the matrix. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, the problem with these is as they get big is consistency and validation. It's actually making sure that you, you're not going to put security problems into the system with inconsistencies within the policy. And you need to be clear how you're going to do that analysis. So we need to figure out what's of value, figure out how it should be protected, who should be allowed to do what. And then we need to figure out what might go wrong. In a perfect world, you can stop at the policy point because no one's going to break any of the rules. You can simply publish the rules, and then if someone's not allowed to look at something, they won't look at it. Clearly, that's not actually going to work. But um, it, in some theoretical perfect world, you can stop there. But really, this is what the core of this talk is about is. Um, once we've worked out what it is that we want to protect and how, we need to work out how things might go wrong, and that's called threat modeling. And a threat is somebody breaking the security policy. Any system will have vulnerabilities, some of them designed in by mistake, some of them because of technology, some of them because external people have opportunities and can attack it in unexpected ways. And a threat is an attacker exploiting one of those vulnerabilities. And working out what those threats are is actually the core of doing security work, of security design. And this is what security engineers spend a lot of their time and careers actually, or wanting to actually work on. It's often why they became security engineers, because it's the most interesting bit. The OWASP guys have got quite a lot of free information. If you go and look at their, their, their website, it's a big wiki. They're a community organization. Um, they say that the reason you do threat modeling is to focus your security attention, optimize your security work, by identifying the objectives of attackers, the vulnerabilities they might exploit, and then that allows you to figure out what countermeasures you want to put in front of your system. And you see why you do this? Because until you understand the threats and their, their likelihood and their impact, figuring out where to focus your attention for those mechanisms isn't really all that valuable. And I am strongly of the opinion all developers should be familiar with threat modeling. Um, and generally, wherever I go, I find that's not the case. Um, they're familiar with lots of kinds of modeling. Threat modeling just hasn't reached them. So a really trivial one. You, what, what you're trying to ask is, who might attack your system? What are they trying to achieve? And what vulnerability might they exploit? And so this is a very, very simple case. Um, are you familiar with Alice, Bob, and Eve? Does you work in security? Yeah? Alice and Bob are good subjects, actors. Um, Eve is an eavesdropping actor, hence her, her name start, st starts with an E. And their uh, security people use, use, these, uh, use these names as code to make sure that only the security people in the room understand the joke and all the developers just kind of think they're names. You know? So you can go away and uh, you can find these very, very quickly. There's about six or seven of them w w which are used uh, very commonly. So in this case, all we've got is Alice <coughs> transmitting an encrypted document to Bob um, and having to send a key to Bob via some mechanism. 
And in this case, it's almost trivial. Eve is an eavesdropper that has some kind of access to the transmission channel, as a security engineer would call it, for the key. And so she is an opportunist insider rather than a professional attacker. She wants to get at the document. She manages to intercept the key. Therefore, she, she, she can breach the security policy. In other words, she can decrypt the document she's not meant to be able to read. So that's a very, very simple case. But that's the kind, that's really all threat modeling is. It's just you, you do it for harder and harder cases. Does that make sense? You see why you might do this. That's really the key thing I'm, pro I'm, I'm trying to persuade you all of. The problem, of course, is how do you find the threats, especially when you're starting out, because there's any number of things you could think about. Microsoft have done a great deal of work improving their security in the last 10 years. And one of the things they did was um, they hired a guy called Adam Shostak, who was a well-known security expert and advocate of threat modeling for the masses. And he did, I think, a five-year program to roll threat modeling out right through Microsoft software development organization. And I'm not quite sure how far they got, but they certainly, they trained an awful lot of people right across a number of years and followed up to make sure threat modeling was useful to them. And they produced quite a lot of useful outputs. Um, many of them are, uh, there's a book, which I'll flash up at the end, um, and many of them are available partly through Adam Shostak's personal website. Microsoft largely gave away this stuff. And Microsoft also have a secure software development stream in MSDN that is completely neutral to their technology, so also worth looking at. But one of the things they came up, a little, little baby heuristic to help especially new engineers think about where the threats might be, they said, well, think about spoofing. One of the ways around security mechanisms Oh, one of the ways to break policy is to pretend to be somebody you're not. What ways in your system could somebody pretend to be somebody you're not? Um, and if you remember uh, Moonpig, remember the Moonpig breaches? Was it a year ago, roughly? It caused me to go to Moonpig and close my account. That's exactly what it was. It was a security vulnerability, I think, to be fair, only in the Android application from the write-up I saw, which allowed someone to pretend to be somebody they're not. So spoofing. Could people pretend to be someone they're not? Can people tamper with information in the system? Can people change something that you're relying on them not to be able to change? For example, a transaction record. An audit log would be a, a great example. Can somebody perform an action which is recorded in an audit log and then change the audit log, either as a side effect or via some other covert uh, mechanism? How about repudiation? Can people deny being able to perform an action? Can they say credibly that was someone else? So, for example, uh, if, if there's weak um, authentication uh, at the client end, mobile phones, for example, people might credibly be able to claim that could have been somebody else on my device. This happens in court now. Re reasonably commonly, people claim that might not have been me. Information disclosure, which is often actually the place we start. Can information get out of the system in a way that is uncontrolled, that is a surprise to us, that is a that is a problem to us. Um, most of the big website breaches in recent years have, as a side effect, involved information disclosure. Can somebody deny service? Now, clearly, actually, in internet-facing systems, this is extremely difficult to, to absolutely prevent. But there are many kinds of denial of service. For example, if somebody performs a whole lot of uh, transactions that create an error, and lots and lots of logs are written, or um, errors are written to a particular part of the system, what effect does that have on the service that's running? Does it just continue? Does it stop? Does it manage to throw away old information? There's quite a lot of systems that if you, if you throw enough bad transactions at them, start behaving quite strangely. They may not immediately become insecure, but they, this may be a step on the road. And as in my sort of the next security talk I give, I mean, that's one of the things we talk about is attacks are very rarely just one vulnerability. If you look at the write-ups of nearly all the big attacks, I mean, a hacking team would have been a great example. People, did people see coverage of the hacking team hack? So that was particularly uh, uh, widely reported in the security community for many reasons. Hacking team were a company that provided hacking technology and services mainly to governments. So mainly to governments spying on citizens. So, you know, they had, um, I think even on video, I could say a patchy reputation in the security community. Quite remarkably, this company clearly had a very, very high understanding of information security. They got entirely turned over. Their entire file system got extracted over some period, I think people still don't know quite how long, and published via torrent. 
So it's all out there, including zero-day vulnerabilities, their entire client list, all their financial records, all of their email, the whole lot. Now, for, an, for a security company, that's really pretty embarrassing. But of course, it wasn't just the fact they had one vulnerability. A very skilled um, opponent realized, having found one, that that gave him a toehold, and then from there, he made many steps to actually breach their network. And then finally, elevation of privilege attack, um, which is, can I, while, while still being me, actually gain some kind of privilege I shouldn't have? So for example, those role-based access control models can be a bit vulnerable to this if they're, if they're too complicated. Is some complicated intersection of roles, um, um, or does some inter complicated intersection of roles allow somebody to, be, to pretend to be uh, to the system because of the logic somebody more senior than they really are or more authorized than they really are. So that's the kind of list that the Microsoft engineers find very useful to work through when thinking about their systems. And when you capture a threat model, there are lots of modeling tools. One of the first things nearly every development team asks is, what tool should we use? And I'll go, Excel. It'll be fine. All you need is a table, really. You can do lots of cleverer things. Microsoft have a very nice desktop tool, which they wrote and give away freely. I don't think it's open source, but they give it away freely, which does allow you to draw models and collect all the risks and rank them and risk them and do colored charts. And it's all great, but Excel works, or, you, or your Confluence works just fine. Because all you're trying to record is, what kind of threat did we find? Which bit of the system is the problem? What is the actual problem? And then what are we doing about it? So you know, that's normally just a Jira link, which is, go fix this in this way. The other way you can look at it is you can, um, rather than looking at the system and going, right, where are the problems, you can think like an attacker. This is actually where getting your security team involved can be useful. Thinking like an attacker, um, I've found, takes quite a lot of um, thinking to be credible, because frankly, the, uh, the attackers are normally somewhat ahead of the defenders. So for this to be useful, you do need to have somebody who's, who's reasonably current on security technology and threats. But the idea is quite straightforward. What level of person are you dealing with? Is it what a person who's um, disparagingly referred to as a script kitty, someone who's downloading tools and running them? But frankly, given the power of the tools available to them today on the dark net for $99, I'm not sure that's actually much reassurance anymore. But they're not highly skilled. Or are they completely opportunist? Are they professional attackers? Or are they a state actor? And largely, if it's the last one, you kind of pack up and go home, because state actors have almost infinite resources. Um, what are they trying to achieve? Therefore, what sort of attack might they perform? And then how might they do it? So in this simple example, we're saying, we've got a professional attacker, meaning that they've got resources, time, and expertise. They're not opportunistic, and they probably won't give up quickly. And they're after our customer credit card details. And the way that they're going to attack it is they're going to try and attack the system database. So how might they do this? And the way that we do it is we, sort of, we, we find broad attack vectors, as um, security um, experts would call them, and then we refine each one hierarchically. So for example, if we're going to attack the database directly, we have to password, database passwords, operating system passwords, vulnerabilities, and so on. For database passwords, we could do a known password attack. We could try and extract passwords. We could try and find them in scripts. You know, and you, you kind of head down like that. Um, the advantage of this uh, approach is, one, it often throws up things that just looking at your design doesn't, because you're thinking about goals and possible uh, kind of creative strategies. The other thing is, is that because you end up with a tree, if you can mitigate something high up the tree, it sort of prioritizes your work again. If you can mitigate something high up the tree, such as you know, DBAs can no longer help because we put some security controls around the DBAs, we take an entire class of threat away. So it can help you see where the biggest impact is going to be from security work. And again, it's really straightforward. It does require knowledge, though. This is the one where if you can get your uh, security engineering team involved or you know, one of these small third-party companies that you know, stays up to date with all this stuff, that probably works well. And once you've got threats, what do you do with them? Well, the first thing is, well, we are going to mitigate them. But you know, there's sort of never time for everything. Agreed? We need to understand what the impact is of each possible threat so we can sort of force rank them so we know where to start. And again, um, I think Dread also came from Microsoft. Um, their suggestion is, look at the damage um, a, a threat might result in. Look at how easy it is to reproduce. Look at how exploitable it is. Look at how many users would be affected by it. And look at how discoverable it is. So for example, 
Duxnet, is that a name familiar to you? So that was an industrial control system attack, which was largely thought to be state actors uh, and was unleashed on uh, a Middle Eastern country's uh, nuclear um, program, shall we say. Um, it's very high damage, very, diff very low discoverability, relatively small number of people affected, it's very targeted. Um, reproducibility, really, really difficult probably requiring state actor type of people. So you could argue that if that was your system, that, that's not so important. Whereas something where, um, in my, this example, we've got um, the damage is, um, the, the actual damage, if they get in, they can only attack one user at a time. They're not going to steal everything or destroy everything. So that sort of gets five out of 10. You can reproduce it just with a browser. You don't need lots of special tools. You probably don't need lots of clever expertise, oh dear, that's 10 out of 10. That's pretty serious. If you can do it in, in Chrome, you have a problem. Um, does it need malware? I mean, yes, maybe uh, we need to inject malware. So um, that gives it five. Um, could affect many people in the system, but not everybody in the world. We give it five. And is it easily discoverable? Yes, it's in a threat index. And on Google, we give it 10. We then sort of, we get a ranking. The key thing about all these models is that you don't switch your brain off. Clearly, some of them don't score high, but when you look at them, you go, oh, that's bad. That would be really serious. You shove them up the list. And people do criticize this because um, they feel that what's going to happen is that um, people will just follow this blindly and they won't apply any intelligence and they'll look at the wrong things. And I think that's unfair. It's a useful heuristic for where you start in figuring out wh where to start and how to rank things when we're looking at addressing threats. So I've definitely found it to be a useful model. And if, uh, again, I think it's OWASP, you can certainly find it very easily um, via Google. Um, I think it's OWASP. There's a detailed set of suggestions for how you rank these, these different dimensions. The other place you can find threats is known lists of threats. You can be, so these are published by independent, orga uh, uh, friendly organizations. Um, people like OWASP, people like MITRE, who do work for the UK government, uh, sorry, US government, but they make their stuff freely available. The thing about these is, these are open goals for attackers. You, you do need to know what's on the list because you can be absolutely sure if it's out there, the bad guy knows it's on the list. So it's worth you knowing it's on, or your security engineering team knowing it's on the list too. That's another place that you can get threats. And finally, um, a technique for describing threats, which I, th I think a lot of security people talk about it. I don't see it in use that much, but it's definitely a useful model. Um, is As well as thinking what people need to use the system for, think how people will do bad things to a system. And so those are called security abuse cases. So for example, Normal people log in, search the catalog, and order items. Bad people steal authentication to tokens and then sp spoof your authorization system. Um, you can clearly write up an abuse case rather like a use case with what's the threat, what would need to be true for this to be um, valid, what actually happens, and then if all this happened, how should the system respond to mitigate the threat? Um, I've never seen anyone draw the picture. The pictures are always used in training courses to show people sort of where it all fits. I've never seen one written down. It's a bit like a use case diagram. It's largely content free. Um, but um, the, use, the abuse case itself is sort of a useful structure for thinking through a scenario that you think is credible. Because you, um, if, sometimes you identify a threat and you do think to yourself, really? Could they really do that? And actually, the abuse case structure is quite useful to allow you to kind of work through the bits and work out, yes, but they would need this to be true. And actually, even if that was true, then it's quite likely that they'd hit problems when they, for example, tried to connect internally. They'd probably trigger an alarm. You know, it allows you to think through that. And then it, finally, it allows you to be quite clear. Our system needs to, needs to for example, log people out across all browser sessions after th five wrong password attempts because of this particular abuse case that is obvious to us that it could happen. So we've understood our system, and we've done analysis. And the anal core of the analysis is threat modeling. So this is the bit that most people don't do. Um, and the reason for it is understanding what the problem is and prioritizing our work by ranking our threats so that we know where to start. And we can have a, a reasoned discussion with business stakeholders in particular about where to stop, because none of this is free. The question is then, 
how do we mitigate um, attacks? How do we um, prevent these potential threats actually becoming real exploits? There's two bits to this. The first one is sort of obvious. It's a bit like, how do you make a system run faster? Get it to do less work. It's sort of obvious, isn't it? Except that actually, it's sometimes quite hard to do. This is exactly the same. If you're going to try and make a system secure, minimize the number of things that need to be made secure. And the security jargon for this is minimizing the attack surface. Do you remember on the old wasp picture, there were bad people called threat agents, and they attack systems through things called attack vectors. And all an attack vector is is a clever name for a channel into your system. The attack surface is the security jargon for all of those um, attack vectors bundled together. So it's all the ways into a system. So if you've got a smaller attack surface, then you've got less to attack. Therefore, you've got less to, less to secure. All good. OWASP suggests that if you're, looking for your, if you're trying to figure out what your attack surface is, start by thinking about you've got channels into the system and out of the system of all sorts. Pick ones for humans, you've got ones for files, you've got ones for messages, you've got ones for APIs, and you've got other ones that I'm probably not even thinking about now. And you've got code that actually secures those channels. They're all part of, the, um, part of the attack vector because you'll probably want to exploit the code that's wrapped around the channel. That's kind of how it works. You then think about all the data value inside the application. And as we said earlier, not just domain data, it can be technical data too, and the code that secures that data. That's the stuff that will get attacked. That's your attack surface. So all you have to do is reduce the size of that. What do you see the obvious problem might be? That's directly in conflict with what, have you, what most of your stakeholders want to do, which is to build them more stuff and to have your system do more things. So security people very regularly talk about, well, if you simply minimize the attack surface, my work here is done. I always say, well, if you'd like to go and have a conversation with the business about why we're no longer supporting two-thirds of the functions and, that, and they've no longer got a mobile interface, you knock yourself out. Once you've had that, come back and see how you feel about it. But there are things typically we can do, but they, they, they tend to be, you, you tend to get immersed very quickly in organizational constraints. So to give you a tangible example, suppose we have a system that is some years old. We're not talking like AS400 1976, but you know, more than four or five years old. We've probably got some APIs into it, agreed? And how do you think we built those around about 10 years ago? We probably used WS star, didn't we? Because it, it seemed like a good idea at the time. Well, actually, no, it didn't, but we didn't think we had anything else. So we built using WS star, and there are people in the organization attached to those now. And then a few years later, what happened? Well, everyone realized those were synchronous. So what did the architects tell you to do? All your meetings and messages, they said. Everyone loves a good message bus. In fact, it's your lucky day. We've got an ESB. Are we your friends or what? Just plug into the ESB, your problems go away. So with slightly sinking heart, you integrated into the ESB, but you couldn't turn off the WS star interfaces because some people needed synchronous calls. Um, and all that's working. And then what happened? Well, some joker realized that WS star wasn't a good idea, so they thought JSON over HTTP would be better. And to be fair, it did look a lot better. So uh, your development team, without actually sharing it with anyone, decided that they were going to build some uh, JSON over HTTP RESTful services on the front of the system as well. And so some clients are now using those. So you've got quite a big attack surface. You've got messages you can try and spoof or overload or generally break. You've got WS star stuff. It's probably quite old and you've probably not touched it for a bit. And I wonder if all of those open source libraries are entirely secure. And you've got some new stuff, which is probably where all, all the focus of your attention is. How are you going to minimize your attack surface? Well, from a security engineer's perspective, it's entirely obvious. If you just want to get that WS star stuff decommissioned by the end of the month, and then we'll talk about taking you off the ESB, because clearly everyone's using the JSON over HTTP interface. How do those conversations tend to go in your organizations? Yeah, swimmingly? No, not so good, are they? Yeah, they tend to be a bit painful. They're kind of, we're switching this off. No, you're not. No, really, we're switching this off. Did you not understand no? No, you're not. We're using it. Yeah, I know, but if you just move to the sexy stuff, we have no interest in your sexy nonsense. The old stuff's working just fine. Thanks very much. So it's all very well saying minimize the attack surface. Um, I think this is actually very much, an, um, if you can raise security awareness generally, it's something to challenge everybody with when they're putting more and more variations of things into a system. Certainly, particularly interfaces are attackable. So if you're going to put two in rather than one, you've got twice the fun to secure it.
or maybe even squared if, you've, if you're slightly pessimistic. So um, it's something to keep on challenging as you're going through the development cycle. If you can minimize the attack surface, that's a good thing. But in any case, we need countermeasures. Um, perhaps slightly bizarrely for a talk called Security Beyond the Libraries, I'm not actually going to talk very much about countermeasures because I realized that once I persuaded everybody about the process and threat modeling and why that was so much fun and you should rush back to the office without pausing and start threat modeling your systems, there's not really time to go into countermeasures deeply. So I, I, I decided um, not to sort of do a bad job at it and um, just put, put the placeholder, really, and I, there are plenty of other talks on it. But once you've got your threats, your risks prioritized, you then need mitigations. You cut the risk down as much as you can, but, you know, there's only so much you can do. The key thing about countermeasures is, so we're talking about things like using SSL, using security libraries for access control, using um, secure, robust um, mechanisms for um, authentication and authorization. We're talking about deciding to encrypt data in databases. Anyone here work on PCI DSS compliance systems for credit card processing? Yeah, and payments people in general? Yeah, so presumably, yeah, your bet noir is, crikey, we've got to encrypt some of this damn stuff in the database. Um, or we've got to tokenize it via an appliance. It, none of it's easy. But... Um, the thing about countermeasures to bear in mind is that there are three types and they come with different implications. Quite a lot of them are well known. They're reasonably straightforward. There is I mean, authentication, authorization for role-based access control, securing links with SSL and TLS. Although what's the problem with anything to do with encryption? Any security engineer will immediately show it. Where do you keep the keys? Yes, somebody said key management. Thank you. Yes, where do you keep the keys? And in particular, what do you do if a key is stolen? In a hurry, what do you do when a key is stolen? It's, it's, it's not a trivial problem, but talk to your security engineering team. There are some ways around it. So there's well-known and straightforward stuff, and that's fine. I mean, there's books full of it, and you know, we, we just sort of get on and do it. Some of them, though, are quite complicated, but at least they're well-known. People have thought about it. My classic for this is things like cross-site scripting attacks. Every time I look at cross-site scripting, there seems to be a new way of doing it. I mean, I'm... These days, I don't spend all my time doing web development by any means, but I, I sort of try and keep somewhat in touch with it, and particularly the security of it. And it seems that we get ever more creative at how we're going to spoof people in browsers. Um, there was a security engineer some time ago pointed out to me, he said, really, he said, if you were looking to build the perfect, the perfect insecure attack platform for uh, an application, where would you start? He said, start with a modern web browser. It's absolutely fantastic. It's got the ability to hide things from the end user. It's got the ability to change everything dynamically at runtime. It's got a full programming model. You can download attack code from anywhere on the internet. He said, it's really a very good platform to attack systems from. So it's always worth bearing, in, bearing that in mind. But um, while these things require skill and judgment to put into your systems, they're well known. You can either find information yourself using you know, obvious... Um, <clears throat> internet type sources or books or you can get a third party, party who are experts to come in and do them so in a sense although you need, to fo you need to focus on them and do them they're not that hard the real problems uh, I've seen time and time again is custom solutions now here I do not mean writing your own crypto library if you'd ever thought of doing that just slap yourself on the head now so don't replace standard technology. That's not what I'm referring to. I'm referring to the fact that when you look through the threat model, in your organization, there will be some threats which are not universal, everyone's got this. There will be some that are specific to your domain, your organization, your system, your operations, something about you. They're the ones that are tricky because you need to kind of figure it out for yourself what what a sensible solution is, and that's not tremendously easy. And what I've actually spotted is quite often people go, oh, they're quite hard. Should we start at the top of the list? They go, no, 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 no. Remember we ranked the threats? Yeah, they said, but they're really hard. Anyway, let's start at the top of the list, because straightforward, we can definitely do those. There's no harm, actually, in doing the easy stuff. But um, where you've got high-priority threats specific to your domain, organization, system, technology stack... Those are the ones that are going to require time and effort and a lot of validation to make sure you've got them right because you're not going to find 15 blog posts and a, and a freeware tool to help you do it. So I'll just call that out early is that that's something you're going to need to um, get into. And remember, most of the stuff you read in books and on the internet, security engineering books aside, once again focus all about the technology. And remember, the people in the process are really important as well and actually 
even security engineers actually sometimes don't talk about those all that much. How many of you know, for example, how your data is handled by the operations group in your corporate data centers? I'm sure some of you do, some of you dug into it. Um, on the other hand, I was blissfully unaware for many years how my data was handled by the operations group in the uh, large corporate data centers. You know, are they sh shifting it off-site? Is it secure? Do they have copies? Do they distribute it? Do they move it between regions? All stuff that actually, from a security perspective, depending on the data, might be quite important to you. And yet, in big organizations in particular, it's quite often that this is a sort of black box operation. And because it's a black box operation, you can be quite sure they don't know much about your system, just as you don't know much about what they're doing in operations. And I know DevOps is the answer, and I know that everyone's now cooperating with everyone else, and that the operations teams can't wait to work with the application developers. In some cases, though, they may still be doing things that you may be surprised about. So particularly when you've got highly sensitive stuff, it's worth being quite clear with them that it is highly sensitive. And this is something we see, I mean, we see, it, we, um, we, we've got a sort of completely separate line of business where we do PCI DSS audits. So we, we go into credit card processing type software places and we uh, give them, uh, well, we audit them against the standard. And one of the things that quite often we find findings, it's not, it's, it's not they weren't aware of it, but um, they find that they've actually got PCI DSS data leaking out of the PCI DSS zones in their data centers just because the whole thing wasn't quite joined up. I would lay money on the fact that some people in this room have probably got that problem and don't realize it. So understanding what goes on in the process, people further down the chain bit is also quite important if you actually want to achieve security. That's always the, that's always the question. Do you need to convince someone or do, or do you need to be secure? There is a difference. But assuming you want to be secure, um, it's, it's worth getting into that. And then another aspect of mitigation is incident response. So. I would strongly argue that um, you are going to be breached. It's a question of when, not if. What are you going to do? Do you all remember the Sony attack? Um, Talk Talk was another one, where arguably they responded really poorly. They didn't really know what to do. And it's in, on the security email list immediately after Sony, there was this kind of rhetorical question. How come Sony wouldn't have had an incident response plan? That seems mad. They're really big. And then some wise security engineer went, I bet you they had one. I bet you they got a big consultancy to come in and do it. And I bet they've never looked at it. It was done for them. And then on the day, somebody said, where's the incident response plan? The CISO said, it's on SharePoint. Well, apart from the fact that that had probably been leaked by then. Um, they extracted it from SharePoint. They went, right, what do we do now? Well, actually, incident response is really hard. It's a bit like, who here practices disaster recovery? Please all put your hands up. Yeah. I'll just pretend you all, you all practice disaster recovery. The reason you practice disaster recovery is that when you have a disaster, you're not practicing. You're just doing what, what you know what to do. An incident response requires executives, legal people, so legal implications of the breach, requires management people, and requires technical people to all coordinate together to actually know what to do. So you've got to not only have a plan, you actually have to practice it in a you know, realistic enough scenario, enough times that everyone thinks, while it won't be fun, we do know what we're going to do. And then finally, secure implementation. That is another talk. Um, Secure implementation is a fairly specialist area, but there are some basic rules and basic tools and techniques that everyone can use. I mean, static security analysis is something that we're encouraging as many teams as possible to do. There's some free tools and some quite expensive tools, but um, making sure that you've at least put your critical code through a static scanner that picks up all the, all the obvious security problems is simply good practice. And there are, t there are standard errors that people make all the time, which I know they're obvious, except that they happen all the time. The tools vendors know this because they run their stuff in the cloud and they collect metrics and they keep on having the same problems. And then finally, testing and verification. We test everything else we do. Why don't we test our security? Well, hopefully, then, if you do test your security, but it's quite rare to find it taken all that seriously because it's quite broad and it often requires coordination across a number of groups, including external pen testers, your security experts, your dev teams, and operations. But like anything else, if we haven't tested it, we don't know it works. So we need to somehow factor in testing and verification into the process. And so that leaves us back where we started. We need to understand the system. Analysis fundamentally involves understanding what you've got and understanding what the threats to it are. And when you're mitigating, try and make the thing you're mitigating as small as possible, as well as implementing countermeasures. And finally, you need to validate what you've done. So making sure that you've got reviews and testing in place 
yourselves or experts. So you've got some third party saying, um, even if it's only a person across the hall saying, yeah, that to me looks as if that is re reasonably secure. So in summary, we need to be risk and principle driven to improve system security. It's a people, process and technology game and starting with the libraries, starting with the security technology is very rarely the right place. You, unfortunately, you've got to design it in because it's expensive to add later. It's really difficult stuff to, to retrofit. But the good news is there are simple techniques, lots of experience and lots of heuristics to guide you which are well proven and entirely freely available. There are also lots of communities such as the London OWASP chapter. You can go and meet the people who really know how to do this. And sometimes getting the experts involved is kind of important. I haven't got time to go through the resources, and it's very boring anyway. The only thing I will do is say the book I mentioned is called Threat Modelling by Adam Shostak. But all the books, the slides will be available. All of these books are uh, valuable in different ways. And so with one minute left, I finished my material. So we probably have time for one question before I get cut off. Otherwise... I'm, going to, I'm actually going to finish on time, which is the first time I've done that in years. So thank you very much.